Luke chapter 12. These are the words of Jesus, but they are, in fact, the Word of God. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. May God bless to us the reading and the hearing of this portion of His holy word. Pray with me, please. Breathe on me, breath of God, and set my soul on fire. Amen. I chose to call this sermon Spiritual Arson, Setting the World on Fire for Christ. God willing, as the sermon unfolds, you may come to understand the reason for the title. Jesus was under fire. There is no other way to describe it. Religious and political leaders, angry and hostile toward him, were determined to do him in. The pressure of relentless opposition was closing in upon him. Suddenly, in the midst of that crucible of fire, there surged up from the center of our Lord an anguished soliloquy, a word not so much directed toward heaven or earth, but a word he seemed to be speaking almost to himself. Suddenly he erupted, I have come to bring fire upon the earth, and oh, how I wish it were already ablaze. Today, I wish to take those words which exploded from the heart of Jesus, break them apart, and attempt, with God's help, to analyze their meaning. Jesus said, I came to bring fire. In the Old Testament, Fire always represented the powerful presence of God. You'll remember that when Moses encountered God, he encountered God in a burning bush. In the New Testament, fire also always represented the powerful presence of God. You will remember on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit of God descended upon the disciples, the Spirit came in flaming tongues of fire. But in addition to that in the New Testament, fire also represented the pervasive God's love, that love that is searing, that love that burns, that love that moves and spreads the love which is revealed on the cross of Jesus Christ. You see that absolutely clearly in these few words from Jesus in Luke chapter 12. He says first, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already ablaze. And then immediately he delivers a second sentence, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. Biblical scholars all agree that in that second sentence, Jesus was referring to his baptism with blood, his death on the cross. And so Jesus, by placing these two sentences in parallel form, which is an ancient time-honored Hebrew teaching device, Jesus, by placing them in parallel form, in essence was saying, 
I have come to bring the fire of God's love to the earth. How I wish it were already ablaze. But that fire will be ignited by my death on the cross. And the sooner that happens, the better. That's what Jesus was saying here. That's what he meant when he cried from his heart, I have come to bring fire. Now, if you wish to know what happens to someone caught in that fire of God's love, I would suggest looking, for example, at Saul of Tarsus. Saul was the leader of the Jewish community in Jerusalem at that time, a significant leader and scholar. He had tried very hard to reach that pinnacle, and he had managed to do it. He had frequently tried so hard to make himself look good that he wound up trying to make other people look bad. But all of that, all of that brought out from him a hatred for the Christian community. And so he persecuted Christians with savage glee. And in fact, he was on his way to Damascus for the purpose of snuffing out the little Christian community which had emerged there. And as he was on the way, he encountered God in the risen Christ. It came, the Bible tells us, in a blinding, flaming light. The light was so powerful that it knocked him down into the dust of the Damascus Road. He was left blind by that flaming, fiery light. But that light not only impacted his eyes, it also impacted his heart. The fire of God's love began to burn way down deep inside of him. That fire softening him, changing him, warming him, changing him and transforming him so that ultimately he was a completely different person. He stopped being Saul and instead became Paul. And when you then read his letters again and again, he refers to the power of God's fiery love burning down inside of him. He says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He says, I preach only Christ and Christ crucified. He said, I am persuaded that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, for to me to live is Christ. Imagine what a change. And what changed Paul from a bitter enemy of Christ into a flaming disciple for Christ was nothing less than the fire of God's love revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ. Or I would invite you to go back to the 17th century in France to a man who was regarded then and is actually regarded still as one of the greatest scientists and mathematicians ever to grace the face of this earth. His name was Blaise Pascal. One November evening, he left his work and returned to his home and closed the door and locked it. And then he sat down and he picked up a Bible and he started to read. His eyes fell upon the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus' preparation for the cross is so magnificently described. And as he was reading, suddenly the fire of God's love leapt off the page and ignited Pascal's heart. He suddenly found himself weeping. And then when he gathered himself together, he tried to figure out how to make sense of everything that was happening inside of him at that moment. And so he took a pen and paper, and he wrote the date in November across the top. And then he wrote one great big bold word, fire. And then he began to write down a whole host of phrases that came tumbling out of his mind and his heart, trying to capture oceans of emotion in just a few drops of ink. He put phrase after phrase after phrase, all of them punctuated by that great word, fire. Joy, 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 he wrote. Tears of joy, fire. Later on, he 
wrote a book describing the experience. He titled the book, The Mind of Fire. And then he went on to become one of the greatest saints in the history of the church. Interesting, don't you think, that his name was Blaise Pascal? Dear friends, that's what happens when you encounter the reality of God's love in the cross of Jesus Christ. The power of that love begins to burn its way down inside of you. It begins to warm you and soften you and change you and remake you. It brings light where there's been darkness. It brings warmth where there's been coldness. And suddenly you find yourself perhaps wanting to sing the words of that marvelous little hymn, a hymn which actually was written in the First Presbyterian Church of Orlando in 1935, the hymn, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. That's what Jesus was driving at. When he said, I have come to bring fire upon the earth. And I will not rest until every last human being is ablaze with the love of my heavenly Father. Jesus said, I have come to bring fire. And then Jesus said, I have come to bring fire upon the earth, upon the world. The more I study Jesus' life, the more impressed I am with his worldview. Right from the very beginning, he saw the kingdom of God as a world-encompassing, a world-encircling enterprise. It's amazing when you look at it, how many times the word world crosses his lips. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He said, as the Father has sent me into the world, so I send you into the world. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Jesus understood that he had come for the world. And that means that our call as Christians is a call to the world as well. I know that not always widely or lovingly received. Maybe you heard about that rather opinionated fellow who was in church one Sunday and suddenly they announced that it was Mission Sunday and they were going to take an offering and it, the money was going to go to world missions and everyone was to give generously. Well, when the usher with the plate came to this fellow in the pew, he immediately held up his hand, scowled and snapped, I don't believe in world missions. I wouldn't give a dime to that. Whereupon the usher leaned out close to him, extended the plate and said, well, then why don't you take some money out? This offering is for you. <laughs> who? Dear friends, people who say they don't believe in world missions are people who have not truly read the New Testament and they are not truly following Jesus Christ. One of the first things that he said to his followers was, the field is the world. One of the last things he said to his followers was, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And almost immediately, that's precisely what they did. They went out north, east, west, south. They went out telling everybody they met the stories of Jesus, planting churches in every city and village and town they encountered. The field was the world, and they took the gospel of Jesus Christ to that world. In this day and time, in this country in particular, God forgive us. There are too many Christians who seem to have lost their missionary zeal. I have to tell you, I thank God every day that that is not true of this church. When I ponder the world mission outreach of this church, when I ponder how the people of this church have so generously given to the world mission enterprise of this church, when I ponder all of that, I tell you I am moved to awestruck wonder. The great theologian Emil Bruner once said, 
the church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. I would suggest to you that one of the reasons that this church has so thrived through the years is because this church has never failed to take the great good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the farthest reaches of this world. And thank God that is still true today. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I have come to bring fire upon the earth. And let me tell you, I believe that the day in which you and I are now living is a day affording a remarkable opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. Some amazing things are happening out there in the world. Look, for example, at the Muslim world. The faith of Islam is centered in the book, the Quran. And yet now there are a number of moderate Muslim scholars and individuals who are suggesting that some of the tenets of that book are not adequate for life in this world in which we are living, in particular the mistreatment and the devaluation of women, and also in particular the unbelievable violence wrought by radical Islamists. There is a crisis booming in Islam today, and that crisis is providing an opportunity not there before for us, an opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ that is new and exciting. Look at what's happening in the Far East. Ancient beliefs there which fostered the encouragement of the caste systems, denied the reality of human need, devalued the worth of human life. Those ancient beliefs are now being called into question and there are many in the Far East today pegging Christianity as the faith of the future. And in fact, there are those who say that in the Far East today, the gospel of Jesus Christ is spreading like what? Like wildfire. Look at what's happening in Africa. There is the spark of a spiritual awakening there that is quite extraordinary. My new friend, Shelley Holmeyer, just told me this past week that 500,000 people per month are being won to Jesus Christ on the continent of Africa. That number is increasing month by month. It's creating a bit of a problem. How do you train enough pastors to lead them? How do you build enough churches for them to worship in? But the people are coming to Jesus Christ. Sociologists are now saying that sometime in the midst of this 21st century of ours, sometime, the majority of the people who live on the African continent will bear the name of Jesus Christ. The same thing is happening in Latin America. Oh, dear friends, this is an exciting time for the mission enterprise of the church of Jesus Christ. And all of that is what Jesus meant when he said, I have come to spread fire upon the earth, upon the earth upon the world. So how do we, how do we at MDPC help Jesus spread the fire of the gospel to the world? Well, one thing is this, and let me just say it flat out. Have you pondered the possibility of becoming a missionary? Do you sense that perhaps God might be leading you in that direction. I'm speaking to all of us here, but I'm speaking especially to any young people who might be listening. You see, if you have a little goal for your life, you'll have a little life. If you have a dull goal for your faith, you'll have a dull faith. But if you ever catch the vision of winning the world for Jesus Christ and then pour yourself into that cause of Christ in the world, then your life will become exciting and thrilling and dynamic and adventurous. Give God the chance to call you into the mission service of Jesus Christ in the world. But if that is not God's will for you and if that is not God's call to you, then let me remind you, that you can still support the mission work of the Jesus Christ in this world through this church in significant ways. You can do it through your gifts and through your prayers. No matter your age or circumstance in life, you can pray that the church will reach the unreached peoples of this world for Jesus Christ. 
no matter your age or circumstance, you can give generously to the cause of Jesus Christ through the mission enterprise of this great church. You and I were made for this. We are made for this purpose. We are made to help Christ spread the great good news of his gospel to a world that is desperately in need of hearing it. Some years ago, Ed Beck was an all-American basketball player. He was also a profound Christian. When his athletic career ended, he gave himself to the mission service of Jesus Christ. At one point, he took a group of fellow athletes to Korea there to engage in a mission work project out in one of the villages in Korea. When at last the project was completed, uh, he and his team were engaged with the villagers trying to find ways to say farewell. It was an emotional time. And suddenly, a little Korean girl came walking forward, carrying in her arms bouquets of flowers, which she then gave to Ed Beck and to the members of the team. And then this little girl, struggling with her English, said, these flowers will fade and die, but you will smell here forever. <laughs> I love that. You will smell here forever. Oh, I hope and pray that you and I in this church will smell forever in those places where this very day our people and our money are doing the work of Christ out there in the world. I hope we will smell forever in places like Croatia and Costa Rica, like Egypt and Ethiopia, like Hungary and Honduras, like Guatemala and Uganda, and a dozen other places around the globe. That's the work that this church is doing in the world for the sake of Jesus Christ, spreading the fire of Christ's love everywhere. You and I, you and I, my beloved people, were made for this. We were made to support the work of this church, to go out into the world, to redeem it in the name of Jesus Christ. Because remember, the church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. Perhaps now you can understand why I chose to call this sermon Spiritual Arson, setting the world on fire for Jesus Christ. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Amen and amen.